so now we come to the uh, next master class uh, which is a very important one and the master class is diabetes and covid 19 the evidence so far the risks and the management protocol and to lead this ebm master class we have none other than dr vijay neglur all his credentials are here for you to see but i would like to introduce him as a person who knows his basics so well and that's what makes him a fantastic clinician he is an advisory he's on the advisory committee of the idec and he is also a very good friend he's an excellent clinician with uh, many feathers in his cap and i am sure he is going to uh, tell us everything that we know so far about diabetes and covid-19 uh, over to you vijay to introduce your speakers and uh, also to take the master class forward thank you thank you nita for this brilliant idea of uh, evidence based master class we have a uh, three talented speakers the first is dr nk singh he is a diabetologist from dhanbad the director of diabetes at center dhanbad chairman rss di jharkhand and editor of www.comindia.in next then we have dr arvind gupta i think his cv is quite crowded make it very short he is diabetologist from jaipur and rajasthan hospital he is attached to he has a 34 years of experience in the field of diabetes he has more than 75 publications to his credit and an excellent speaker and a very, very talented uh, diabetologist from Rajasthan. And we have, of course, young, charming, dynamic lady from Mumbai, Dr. Purvi Chabla, who is consultant diabetologist at Lena Hospital, Diabetes Center, Mahavir Hospital, and Bharati Arugini Hospital in Mumbai. And she's an investigator for many trials. So this is our force on uh, discussion in diabetes and COVID-19 evidence so far and risk and management protocol. So welcome everybody. As I said earlier, this is a fantastic idea by Nita and Sanjay and of course Anjali. And uh, I really appreciate the hard work they put in to create a fantastic program. Thank you very much for the invitation. And to set the stage, we all know this is the Wuhan market, wet market. In December, people who visited this Wuhan market developed a kind of a peculiar disease, which was through the bat and pangolin, and it caught the entire world in the, in the great in the great difficulty. And therefore, we see this pandemic, which was declared in the month in the month of March, 2020. So, this respiratory disease outbreaks is been very common for the last 25 years. And we had the Spanish flu as the mother of all pandemics, which was again in 1918, which we saw 500 million patients with 50 million deaths. And now, of course, in 2019 and 20, we have the outbreak of COVID, which has more than 215 million patients and more than 4 million deaths. And this is the worldometer, which is put by the John Hopkins and the fantastic minute-to-minute -minute update. It's a unique, you know, this is updated yesterday, which looked at 219 million patients and four million, more than 4 million deaths that you see across the globe. This is the publication which looked at the prevalence of the diabetes amongst the patients who have COVID and the intensity of diabetes based on the problems of intensity of the disease. And we see here this geography representation looks at the mortality of patients of diabetes with severity of the disease. And we all know it's because of various factors, because of ACE2 expression, increased furin level, and T cell and complement defect that they have, increased interleukin-6, and that the CDC said that hospitalization was six times higher and deaths 12 times higher for COVID-19 patients with reported underlying condition like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and chronic lung disease. This is again a meta-analysis which looked at the eight studies, more than 3,000 patients, and said that the new onset of diabetes is roughly to the tune of 14.4% in these patients. That's a new onset of diabetes, and it's very robust evidence to say that the onset of diabetes can be in the beginning. We just discussed about pregnancy, and COVID infection is also quite common in the pregnancy, and they required an intensive treatment, and these people they do well, but they require a mechanical ventilation. Sometimes they have a prolonged hospitalization as well, but the outcome is not bad. 
There are data of 538 con, uh, uh, participants in the world. And we know that there are temporary changes in the diagnostic methodology of GDM during, during the pandemic episode. People have stopped doing OGTT, which is the gold standard to evaluate the patients of GDM in, in pregnancy. So this is the study, which again, looked at 7,000 patients from China, which said that the cause of survival is difficult if the sugar is below 180, which is the 11% death. If it's below 180, the sugar survival is better. So therefore, the idea is to keep the sugar below 180. This is again a meta-analysis by Kamlesh Kunti, looking at more than 2 million patients from United Kingdom. And what is interesting is that the mortality was seen much more common in people who consume DPP for inhibitors and insulin. Of course, this is just an association. Maybe the patients came in a critical condition at that point of time, and therefore the mortality is very high. It only talks about association, but not causality. And therefore, in this context of COVID-19 pandemic, there is no clear indication to change the prescribing of the glucose-lowering medication in type 2 diabetes. But then we saw the, again, from frying pan to fire, that we saw the growth of mucormycosis in patients of COVID, and especially with the hyperglycemia, with excess steroid, excess free iron, trauma inflammation, dysregulated immune response, and eventual immune exhaustion. And we have how to take the bitter with the sweet. We'll discuss again with the panelist. We'll go into details of this about the various receptor and how you get mucormycosis. And then we face the second wave somewhere in the month of May. And this could be because of governmental relaxation, the travel, the pandemic fatigue that people got, the variants of the virus, and of course the vaccine hesitancy. And that has brought to us the, what is called a long hauler. This is a study from Italy which looked at 143 patients who presented with anxiety, depression, cardiac disease, interstitial lung disease, post-exercise fatigue, malaise, chest pain, and so on and so forth. We discussed this also during our discussion. And we have getting a lot of these waves. And the second and third wave affected the interrupted care for the chronic disease, especially diabetes. And that saw the birth of telemedicine in a big way. And we could bridge the gap between the patient and a doctor with the help of technology and the telemedicine, and we could reach our patients. This is the projection of the post-pandemic SARS-CoV-2 by CIDRAP, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy from Minnesota, which talks about the peaks and valleys. And so we expect this pandemic to continue till next year, January. Maybe it can extend up to June next year. And this is the expedition of vaccine development pathway that we see in routinely it takes about 10 to 15 years, but because of pandemic, we have, I mean, speeded up to 12 to 18 months and we have plenty of vaccines in the vaccine war and a lot of hesitancy regarding vaccine. This is what you see people responding to vaccine therapy. And we all discussed today on all these matters, which has showed as a curtain raiser and to that, we have these talented speakers and we introduced them already. So I'll stop sharing slides here and request Dr. N.K. Singh to discuss about new onset diabetes during the COVID infection, hyperglycemia and COVID outcomes, COVID diabetes and pregnancy, a perfect storm and obesity and diabetes mortality. So over to Dr. N.K. Singh. And after N.K. Singh, we'll introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta. Over to you. Uh Excellent, sir. You have set the stage and I think uh, everything important has been already told by you. Uh, next 10 minutes, uh, as you given the task to me, to let me just first say, have a slide show. One minute. Yeah, from, I think it is, uh, I'm audible and the slides are being shown on your screen. Yes. So, yeah, yes, sir. So I think uh, this is a very, very important EBM session uh, with uh, all the things which we need to know in the COVID related things. So new onset diabetes is a very important issue and uh, hyperglycemia has many aspects in COVID and uh, COVID diabetic and pregnancy is a very perfect storm could be and obesity and the diabetes mortality is a very important. So the, my first part is 
that definitely yes as you shown uh, the how the prevalence is occurring with of the new onset diabetes you showed uh, dr bj has shown a very very important data just now so an interplay of insulin resistance and possible insulin secretory defects has been recently proposed as a possible pathogenic mechanism of new onset hyperglycemia in patients with covid-19 so with new onset diabetes one thing i will say that it has worse outcomes people with new onset hyperglycemia even without disease have poor outcome compared to individuals with pre existing diabetes or normal glycemic subjects with covid 19 so this is very important ki how all these things are happening and you can see the striking blots here uh, the inflammatory cytokines are increasing hyperglycemia vascular endothelial damage so many things occurring at the same time so many of these patients may have undiagnosed diabetes too i agree or impaired glucose tolerance that could have been exacerbated by a stress counter regulatory hormones increasing insulin resistance autoimmunity and plausible beta cell stress due to concomitant hypoxia and inflammation of islet microvascular so this is very important so definitely uh, we have got new onset diabetes severe metabolic complications of pre existing diabetes including diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolarity of which we have seen in our issue that exceptionally high dose of insulin are needed so this is very important again so how this well recognized stress are doing it is being shown here so a story so far is nevertheless the large question is whether new onset diabetes in the setting of covid 19 is directly related to covid induced beta cell damage is uh, you can say it happens but we cannot say with concrete evidence at present this can only be substantiated by documenting beta cell loss through histological evidence in large autopsy based studies which are currently lacking and hyperglycemia could occur in covid pandemic by so many things effect on beta cell effects on systemic covid 19 infections effects of lockdown was also there to so new onset hyperglycemia or diabetes or worsening or glycemic control in pre so lots of things is being shown here so you can have covid induced diabetes pre existing diabetes covid treatment related hyperglycemia stress hyperglycemia and very important glucocorticoid steroid associated hyperglycemia but the odd ratio for death for covid 19 among people with or without diabetes you can see here in type 1 diabetes it, with one study it has been shown 3.5 but in type 2 it is 2 points so it is not less and even type 1 diabetes less than 70 it is 6.3 year and type 2 diabetes are uh, less than uh, here 70 to 3.7 so you can see the problem so no in pre existing diabetes if it is happening so there is no increase of covid 19 infection but there is increased risk of adverse infection outcomes uh, like severe disease icu admissions need for assisted ventilation and mortality and also increased risk of long covid has been found now so i will say here that few reports have indicated that there is an increased risk of acute metabolic decompensation in people with diabetes including dkia in both type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes as well as new onset diabetes so it happens you can see here two three fold increase a uh, seb i am giving you the severe meta analysis conducted i uh, and few of these meta analysis additionally report a significant two to three fold so this is happening and this meta analysis suggests that patients having severe covid 19 and dying are more likely to have diabetes the second part is a covid diabetes and pregnancy and this is a perfect storm as yes, it could be you guys all lots of things are happening suppose in pregnancy some metabolic things like arterial hypertension this lipoproteinemia visceral obesity or new alcoholic hepatic steatosis so retrospective analysis has been done and this has shown higher risk for severe pneumonia release of tissue injury related enzymes excessive and controlled inflammation responses hypercoagulable state coagulable state associated with dysregulation of glucose metabolism so these things can happen in pregnancy so remember so this happens in pregnancy so next part is here very interesting is that there are clear hints that prognosis of patients diagnosed with covid 19 and diabetes may be associated with a simplified viral uptake by receptor h2 as you know 
तो ये बेस हायर बेसल वैल्यू ऑफ प्रो इन्फ्लामेटरी साइटोकाइंस विथ स्विच फेसिलेट ए साइटोकाइन स्टॉम इज ए पॉसिबिलिटी इन प्रेगनेंसी सो व्हाट हैपेंस हियर सी दैट एज पर द दिस डेटा द रेट ऑफ कोविड-19 डायग्नोसिस इन प्रेगनेंट वुमेन अटेंडिंग और एडमिटेड टू हॉस्पिटल इज समथिंग अराउंड 10% एंड प्री एग्जिस्टिंग डायबिटीज वाज एसोसिएटेड विद सीवियर कोविड-19 इन प्रेगनेंसी विद व्हाइल जीडीएम वाज नॉट तो डाटा एग्जिस्ट whatever we have today that suggest that the higher risk of pregnancy complication including preterm birth and preeclampsia so these things have been shown ki how this the possibility of vertical transmission remains could be there and some reports also suggesting that placental infection happens in diabetes so many experts conclude that patients who are diagnosed with diabetic are more susceptible to inflammatory cytokine storms leading to deterioration of covid 19 as we are also aware that the diabetes is a pro inflammatory state so pro inflammatory state in the first part to anti inflammatory becomes it in the second part and to second pro inflammatory state in the third trimester so this is happening in pregnancy having this in mind the hypothesized cytokine storm caused by this covid may lead to more severe inflammatory state in pregnant women resulting in severe morbidity and mortality so these things are happening so a uh, diabetic pregnancy clearly need a special care number one uh, and complex interplay of diabetes and scar is currently unknown and prognosis of pregnant women with diabetic and covid 19 may be associated with potential underlying mechanism such as simplified viral uptake by s2 a higher basal value of pro inflammatory cytokines being hypoxemic as well as platelet activation embolism and preeclampsia so in the context of transgenerational programming and covid 19 lifelong consequences may be programmed during gestation this is very important and by pro inflammatory inflammation hypoxia or over or under expression of transporters and enzymes and epigenetic modifications based on changes in the intrauterine milieu so this is a big danger which you can see uh, could happen so covid 19 may cause new onset diabetes also here and that vertical transmission from mother to might be may be possible so these are things which are very important in relation to the pregnancy last part obesity and diabetes you see here the data that several hundred studies are there and the recent study suggesting that 5 to 10% higher risk for covid 19 hospitalization uh per every kg of square meter higher bmi so genetic data occur with hazard ratio increasing by 14% per year and so a bmi to covid 19 links differ markedly from prior bmi infection associations are further supported as likely caused by multiple biological pathways so this is very important you can see here the danger of extra kilo how this is going to give you the problem for the hospitalization hospitalization so this happens you can see here so i will say here that uh, this obesity contributes to metabolic derangements poor vascular health and greater thrombotic potential and can also adversely impact lung and renal function and there may be also indirect links between obesity and covid 19 outcomes such as adverse diet induced microbiome impact on immune deficiency so the, what is the mechanism the systemic factors are there biochemical factors are there leading to increased vulnerability of this infection increased likelihood of severe covid course of covid 19 and high mortality rate so lastly i will say you a very studies are there and this is showing how even the bmi from 25 to 29 30 to 30.9 and even 40 how this is changing the risk of critical uh, hazard so there are clear cut mechanisms i shown i showed you so lastly i will tell the final points that this covid leading to beta cell damage cytokine storm at admission hyperglycemia worsening of metabolic control in patient with diabetes and well uh, no, i will not say it is documented but there is possibility of new onset diabetes which uh, now we are more and more our data is coming then we will be able to say it. so lastly the last point is the, my conclusive remarks are that the type 1 2 and type 1 diabetes are associated with increased risk of covid 19 related hospitalization and severe outcomes including morbidity a uh, mortality particular in people with poor glycemic control and recent data has suggested an increased risk associated with development of new onset diabetes 
following COVID-19 hospitalization, however, long-term follow-up data will determine if this diabetes is permanent. Currently, there is limited data on maternal, fetal, and neonatal outcomes of pregnant women with SARS-CoV-2 infection are available. However, the data that exists suggests higher risk of pregnancy complications, including preterm birth and preeclampsia. And lastly, the, there are several hundred studies provide powerful evidence that the body mass index is a strong linear risk factor for severe COVID-19 outcome with recent studies suggesting five to 10% higher risk for COVID-19 hospitalization per every kg you get. So I will end here uh, with thank you very much. King cannot kill queen while king is in the check. So think to check the king in COVID-19 that is diabetes and obesity. So I will uh, stop sharing here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for uh, setting the stage and understanding the scope of the problem to treat uh, the COVID during the pandemic of diabetes. Sorry, diabetes in the pandemic of COVID. Now we'll carry on, carry on with Dr. Arvind Gupta, who will be discussing with us about the management of diabetes. He will discuss about prevention of ketoacidosis, steroid controversy, and of course, the mucormycosis that we have. And of course, what I mentioned about telemedicine, it's over to Dr. Arvind Gupta. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Naglur, for your kind introduction. Uh, do you see my slides? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Just a minute. Uh, and at the outset, I also want to thank the IDEC team, especially very dynamic Dr. Neeta, Dr. Anjali, Dr. Vijay Naglur himself, Dr. Sanjay Agrawal, and all the team for uh, putting the excellent scientific program, which is the IDEC. Uh, now, uh, regarding the today's uh, deliberation regarding the management of diabetes during COVID is very, very important thing and very sensitive part and how to prevent the ketoacidosis by judicious use of insulin, and uh, steroid controversies are definitely there. The previously we never thought of the high doses of steroids in any disease and particularly COVID era has shown us that high doses of steroids were used and uh, with good uh, outcome. Of course, the, with the use of so many uh, steroids and uh, other drugs, the mucormycosis like things have come up like anything. And of course, Dr. Neglur has set this stage that we need teleconsultation and government of India has recently recognized the teleconsultation as a legal uh, thing. So regarding how to manage the diabetes uh, during the COVID, the most important thing is we have to be very careful for the glycemic control. That should be very optimal. I can say not very intensive, but optimal glycemic control is important. And most of the studies suggest that the glucose con concentration in the airway secretion is directly proportional to the blood glucose concentration. Hence, the glycemic control is important. And of course, uh, appropriate glycemic control limits the complications associated with the hyperglycemia as well as the COVID complications. And if you want to prevent the diabetes complications, you have to have the, the, the diabetes control uh, optimally. Now, the, before I'll go for the diabetes control, the most important is how to monitor the blood sugar. That is important thing. And most of the protocol, this is AIMS protocol, and which says that if you have no hyperglycemia at admission, but as far as the more mild to severe disease, if you see here, the, you have to reinitiate the blood glucose monitoring several times in a day, just to see at what time the the, the blood sugar rises and accordingly you have to manage. If the uh, steroids are already on the board, then you have to have a very frequent monitoring. And if steroids are given once a day in the morning, I think it is the afternoon blood sugar or before noon blood sugar is very, very important to control. So depending on the high risk individual, cardiovascular disease, obese, or if uh, elderly patients, you have to monitor very frequently the blood sugar. So cell monitoring of blood sugar, as well as the monitoring in the hospital is very, very important. Now, how to start the oral gl glycemic drugs, oral antihyperglycemic drugs. This is very important during COVID. What about the recent, very recent study, which is published one week before, which says that if you don't have any complications, patient is stable, 
there is no contraindication for any oral glucose lowering agents that is the first thing so if you uh, patients are settled don't worry about it. but during the mild covid and some mild hyperglycemia into that then you have to see what drugs to be given during covid the relatively safe molecule is the dpp4 inhibitor uh, i think if a mild uh, covid patient is not hospitalized or even patient hospitalized in the ward don't worry you can very well give the dpp4 inhibitors and all dpp4 inhibitors are okay now to be caution cautiously given the metformin and sulfonylureas metformin for the risk of lactic acidosis because the patient may not be hydrated patient may not be taking nausea and vomiting or some patients are not having good uh, uh, i mean uh, the food or maybe they are hemodynamically unstable or hypoxia i think metformin should not be given sulfonylureas for the risk of severe hypoglycemia again i think you should judiciously give or don't give then if stop if the patient disease severity increases the the sglt2 inhibitors because of the risk of severe dehydration and maybe patient may go into euglycemic ketoacidosis pyoglutagen again with the risk of fluid retention and edema i think should not be given so dear friends the relatively safe are dpp4 inhibitors and patient is having absolutely hemodynamically stable metformin can be given now the most safe and the better uh, is the insulin so how to prescribe insulin if there are contraindications to use the oral glycemic agents uh, anti hyperglycemic agents then definitely during the moderate or severe covid you have to give the insulin there are different regimes for giving the insulin but i think the the better is the basal bolus regime where you have to give three times bolus and one uh, basal insulin and start with uh, lower doses of re regarding the points 4 units per kilogram per day and then it is individualized i can't say that you have to start with a very low dose you can start with the, when the patient is a severe hyperglycemia you can even start with a little higher doses of insulin of course deciding the basal bolus component is highly highly individualized now the target of blood sugar during this period is should not be very intensive i told you we don't want hypoglycemia hence pre meal should be around 110 to 150 and post meal should be around 140 to 200 now if the even we are not able to control with basal bolus i think severe hyperglycemia high doses of steroids septicemia is there patient is having already hemodynamically not very stable in that situation i think insulin infusion is the best thing start insulin iv infusion at a dose of 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kilogram body weight titrate it up titrate down titrate the, uh, as per the blood sugar profile uh, but again the target should not be very low target should not be very high it should be between 140 to 220 uh, uh, when you are giving iv infusion so this is why i am telling this is important to prevent the diabetic ketoacidosis also so you have a iv infusion to start with in a very severe hyperglycemic state and uh, i think uh, when the patient is uh, now new onset of diabetes as dr nk singh has said or steroid induced diabetes into that situation you can have a very low uh, insulin doses required patient but if the patient is having uh already on the uh, board very high sugars uh, even during the whole day the fluctuations are there so you can even combine insulin uh, with the oral hypoglycemic agent so you can give one or two uh, i mean dpp4 inhibitors along with the insulin so this is how we titrate the dose of insulin as per as the the combination of oral hypoglycemic drugs are concerned of course in a severe hyperglycemia i told you just now it should be the iv infusion so dear friends insulin regime is very very important during the covid situations the basal bolus is the best and safest uh, to start with and once the patient is controlled now if patient is i told you once the uh, warning uh, steroid uh, that causes the high uh, hyperglycemia severe hyperglycemia after the the uh, on the afternoon in that case just one bolus injection before lunch 
will be sufficient to control the postprandial hyperglycemia and of course the basal insulin can be given in the night so basal plus regime is also important of course the correctional insulin with or without basal insulin can be recommended but overall i can say it is the monitoring of the blood sugar frequently when the patient is having even one day twice once a day twice a day or thrice a day steroids so dear friends the diabetes management revolves around the most important thing is adequate metabolic control is required regular self monitoring blood sugars are very very important and may sometimes you may require the continuous glucose monitoring of course it is uh, not feasible every time so but you have to have a combination of your team regarding the healthcare workers and of course sometimes in the patient is uh, not hospitalized at home you have a very frequent telemedication covid 19 vaccination is the most important thing which we have seen it is a preventive to the serious uh, 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 complications of covid of course the carefully adjust the regular therapy so dear friends good glycemic control frequent monitoring stabilize your cardiac and renal station the nutrition is the most important is give the good immunity to counteract with the hyperglycemia and the complication regular exercise if possible meditation medication uh, i mean the yoga uh, along with the the, the uh, physical activity and of course self quarantine during the active covid is more important dear friends second important thing is the controversies regarding corticosteroids we all know about this fact that chronic use of corticosteroid leads to 94% higher risk of hospitalization due to diabetes complications and they require to pay close attention to blood sugar monitoring i told you there is a unpredictable hyperglycemic fluctuations during the day when the patient is on high doses of steroids 20 to 50% patient without a previous history of diabetes show hyperglycemia dr nk singh sir has just told uh, to us now and 34% uh, patient with severe acute respiratory syndrome who received glucocorticoid treatment but diagnosed as steroid induced diabetes so this is very important thing how the steroids uh, are helpful during the covid situations this is a very well if you see the mechanism here it is the glucocorticoid response uh, elements this is gre is very important so glucocorticoids act, action on the nucleus through the gre whether it's a trans activation negative gre effects or trans repression increases the nxn increases uh, uh, ihb uh, alpha slp1 or interleukin 10 simultaneously reduces the cytokine storm through the decrease nf kappa b interleukin 6 interleukin 2 tnf alpha and so many pro inflammatory cytokine are reduced by the corticosteroids hence they are very very helpful during the covid and this has to be this has been very well documented by a very important study known as recovery study and recovery study has the first time demonstrated to reduce mortality in one that is instantly available and affordable worldwide that is dexamethasone and recovery trial has shown impressive 35% mortality reduced reducing among the sickest patient on invasive me mechanical ventilation and 20% reduction of mortality so i think dexamethasone is very important and it says that it reduces the 28 day mortality reduces the duration of hospitalization and progressive uh, progression to in invasive mechanical ventilation but this is important thing that so many effects of the uh, corticosteroids are there i don't want to enumerate those things but the important thing is that the when to use steroid that is important thing please don't use the uh, steroids in a very very early stage because virus replications are there and if you use steroid very early then it may increase the replication of the virus hence it is a second or third phase where the hyper inflammatory phase is there the corticosteroids are being used so i want to give a real precaution and take home message that please avoid corticosteroid at all cost in the early phase of covid 19 especially the first 5 days from the symptom onset 
this is very important if they are giving steroids in the first week i told you it may actually suppress the body's immunity and lead to hyperglycemia and worsen the spread of infection so dear friend the final points are important thing is that the corticosteroids are very very important uh, uh, i mean drugs during the the, the covid uh, inflammation data from observational cohorts were very inconclusive of course but recovery data uh, has shown that the steroids are very effective especially the dexamethasone it can be any drug other than dexamethasone hydrocortisone or methylprednisolone at the dose equivalent to 6 mg of dexamethasone to 5 to 10 days will be more than sufficient to use so injudicious use of uh, steroids are not at all warranted and if you give the modern thing is the mucormycosis i think one of the uh, uh, questions you already asked about the mucormycosis so people with diabetes with covid are considered vulnerable to fungal infection already and if patients are already having high doses of steroids then it may impair the cellular pathways responsible for mucorels invasion in the diabetes and ultimately what is the mechanism it is the phagocytosis is impaired as well as the polymorphonuclear chemotaxis and macrophages are unable to phagocytosis the spores which are there of the fungus then it leads to a free spores in the tissues ultimately these spores swell and form the buds that elongate into hyphae and these polymorphonuclear cells are recruited but impaired oxidative buds activity is associated with fungal growth so dear friends this is very very important so if the patient is already has impaired immunity or cellular pathways important thing is what mucormycosis may develop and with the steroids most of the you have to control the hyperglycemia and monitor so the time of presentation may be around third week of onset of symptoms of covid 19 and there were so many risk factors for that may be uncontrolled diabetes may be rampant and irrational use of high doses of steroids may be new onset of diabetes where the hyperglycemia is very prolonged icu stay is also important so there are several risk factors other than the covid it is the aids it is the the, the uh, desferoxamine where the patient is i mean taking iron uh, oscillation or something like this diabetes and malnutrition so many vague symptoms are there you have to catch very early like fever nasal uh, ulcers necrosis periorbital facial swelling decreased vision ophthalmoplegia sinusitis and headache you have to control i mean catch very early these signs and symptoms and when you see these signs and symptoms please go for the investigations to to see whether patient is developing mucormycosis or not yeah yeah so i this? think yeah, yeah. yeah. so i think the important thing is the treatment part timely initiation of the uh, treatment with amphotericin b uh, is very very important and there are certain do's and don'ts especially about the steroid uh, judicious use of the steroids timely initiation of amphotericin b and insulin if it is required i think more important thing i don't want to give the only government of india has recently legalized the teleconsultation but with some limitations so the covid has given us the opportunity to have a good teleconsultation and this uh, uh, dr neglur has already said to us about the thing but we have to use certain medications on teleconsult teleconsultation and certain medication we cannot prescribe and especially like some of the drugs which are known as uh, the list in the b or prohibited list you cannot prescribe like anti cancer drugs narcotics as morphine and codeine etc you cannot prescribe however anti diabetic drugs like metformin glibenclamide or dpp4 inhibitors sglt2 inhibitors can be prescribed during the teleconsultation and add on to other drugs also can be prescribed but you have to see whether some drugs can be prescribed and then you have to be very well versed with the the a b and o list which is uh, already given by the government of india thank you very much dr okay. neglur i am sorry for if i exceed one minute time uh, thank you very much dr gupta uh, we are a little running short of time purvi i think it's your turn now to talk about the post covid clinical manifestation vaccines and breakthrough infection 
the yes. mental health of these patients and the future prediction third wave. I know we're a little short of time, but Purvi, I think uh, you can take eight to nine minutes to finish your talk. Thank you, the dynamic team of uh, IDEC 2020, 2021, uh, Dr. Neeta and Dr. Sanjay for having me here. Thank you, Dr. N.K. Singh and Dr. Arvind Gupta for navigating the tracks of COVID-19 and diabetes and running so well and passing on the baton to me. Thank you, Dr. Neglu, sir, for the mastermind behind this evidence-based master masterclass for um, assigning me COVID clinical, COVID related clinical manifestations post uh, the acute illness, including mental health, vaccination and breakthrough infections, and then prediction of the third wave. Uh, so 10 to 35% of patients not requiring hospitalization develop post COVID symptoms, regardless of comorbidities and up to 80% of those hospitalized with severe illnesses had persistent symptoms for weeks or months after the in initial infection disrupting work and quality of life. This is nothing but the long-term consequences of COVID-19 ensuing the uh, acute illness, which is now a, a recognized uh, uh, entity called post-COVID-19 syndrome, uh, defined last, described last year and then refined uh, by definition by Green All Get All, calling COVID-19 associated illness extending for more than three weeks after the onset of symptoms and chronic, chronic COVID-19 as persistent symptoms extending beyond 12 weeks after the onset of symptoms. Uh, several groups have uh, classified the, the post-COVID syndrome differently. Becker et al. at University of Cincinnati Medical Center based on initial symptoms, duration of symptoms, period of quiescence and delayed onset of symptoms if from types 1 to type 5. Uh, Baylor College of Medicine, Amenta EM at group based on persisting symptoms, organ dysfunction and even new uh, onset of symptoms and uh, then so on and so forth. It's a plethora of debilitating symptoms and conditions, fatigue being the commonest, dyspnea, exercise, reduced uh, exercise tolerance in particular, and even new onset and deteriorating dyspnea and pulmonary fibrosis. Chest pain, gastrointestinal symptoms, olfactory, gustatory symptoms with loss of uh, sense of smell as well as taste. Uh, cardiac arrhythmias persistently increased BP, myocarditis, sleeping, mental disorders like anxiety, depression, neurological manifestations as well, and cardiovascular disease related to a thromboembolic phenomena. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the neurological outcomes. Severe psychiatric and neurological conditions may have have been observed in association with Alzheimer's, in particular PTSD, Guillain-Barre syndrome, depression, and also cognitive impairment. In those with Parkinson's and COVID-19 who develop post-COVID syndrome, also there is worsening of uh, motor function and increase in the levodopa requirement. Neuromuscular as well as neurocognitive uh, impairment is the underlying defect which manifests differently as well, there are several manifestations of profound pro-inflammatory cytokine response and hypercoagulable state. Just one piece of evidence, a retrospective study from the UK, which was uh, recently published, uh, that evaluated 201 low-risk patients, predominantly middle-aged females, with uh, symptoms ongoing at least four weeks post the acute illness and recovery from that. When they analyzed through MRI, they found that, uh, so many different organs affected, with at least 70% of them having one organ dysfunction. Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children as well as adults is also a recognized and a more and more a studied entity where patients may present with either shock, cardiac dysfunction, gastrointestinal symptoms, dermatologic or muc mucocutaneous manifestations, and increased inflammatory markers with distinct absence of severe respiratory illness. And this may be attributed again to endothelial damage and thromboinflammation and RT-PCR may often be negative in this case. The pathogenesis is nothing but a multi-system infection with, neurotropic, uh, with neurotropism, lung dysfunction, as well as affection of the pancreatic beta cells over a milieu of uh, prolonged inflammation uh, and uh, cytokine uh, storm, as well as uh, the hypercoagulus a hypercoagulable state that is uh, caused by COVID. 
Again, mental health and COVID-19 are well recognized because we know public health emergencies affect the health, safety, and well-being at both individual as well as community levels and bring about or trigger a range of emotional reactions, distress, or psychiatric conditions, unhealthy behaviors, or non-compliance with public health directives as well. But in particular, females, elderly, and those with multiple comorbidities are, are more affected. Anxiety, depression, sleeping disorders have increased in patients of diabetes post-COVID. Manifestations also have included obsession and compulsive behavior, reduced social activity, poor concentration or aggression or ir irritability, and even an in increase in substance use and cognitive defects. Post-traumatic stress disorder is another uh, recognized entity which is uh, increasingly being diagnosed and diabetes distress definitely worsens in this scenario, decreasing the self-management skills as well as worsening glycemic control, which the previous two speakers have beautifully elaborated on. So future direction, clinicians definitely need to be trained more and more as more and more patients uh, coming out of COVID uh, and in the post-COVID scenario will be seeking our help and registries that need to be set up where we can uh, study these, the entire, the full clinical spectrum of the COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 syndrome. And also the vaccination uh, seems to help in this post-COVID symptoms, even though there is no formal study reporting that, but definitely boosting of T cells and other immune responses may help uh, with that. Now, moving on, uh, as of two days ago, 11% of India's population is doubly vaccinated. And despite such high, uh, despite this encouraging number, uh, Dr. Catherine O'Brien of WHO has clearly said that no vaccine gives 100% of the people 100% of protection. And we have seen breakthrough infections as well, and typically described by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as, a, uh, as uh, an infection or the detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA or antigen in the respiratory uh, specimen collected from a person uh, who is vaccinated, uh, completely vaccinated and post 14 days of the same. Characteristics, this breakthrough infection may be uncommon, may be driven by virus uh, variants and may be shorter and milder um, illness when partially or fully vaccinated uh, in patients. But some may be more vulnerable, like the immunocompromised, and it may be attributed to low neutralizing antibodies and lack of COVID appropriate behavior. This uh, infographic is, gives out a very important message uh, from uh, Houston, Texas, where 130 hospitalized patients were seen. Only nine were vaccinated, but of those nine, only two required ICU admission and one required ventilatory support when suffered from COVID-19. REACT study, one of the largest studies from UK involving 98,000 volunteers of COVID, of, uh, suffering from COVID-19, they found that unvaccinated people were three times more likely than fully vaccinated people to test positive for COVID-19. This is a breakthrough infection. Double vaccinated people in the most recent round were also had 50 to 60% reduced risk of infection, including asymptomatic infection as compared to unvaccinated people. And those who were fully vaccinated may be less uh, viable to spread the infection to others. 4% as opposed to 8% of the unvaccinated people reported a recent contact with a COVID-19 case tested positive. So with that, again, I want to show you that uh, a New York study recently reported a case uh, report where two women with uh, post-vaccination had developed infection and viral sequencing found that there were variants or mutations found, uh, E484K in one woman and three other mutations uh, of the virus seen in both of them. So this means that the virus is constantly mutating and may escape the immune barrier, which is caused by the, which is given to us by the vaccine. Again, uh, a few studies have been reported from India as well, but I'll take this one from Vellor, CMC Vellor, where 10 and a half thousand employees, 85% of them were vaccinated predominantly by COVID shield. And among these 10% developed infection 47 days after the second dose, vaccination prevented infection by 65%, 
hospitalization by 92% and ICU admission by 94% respectively. Uh, another important uh, uh, report from JAMA last month said that the HEROES Recover Network study showed that vaccines reduce the risk of infection by 90% and a new analysis in NEGM further corroborated the same, uh, uh, the same findings with further emphasis on improved recovery with vaccination. The Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, a subunit of University of Minnesota, has predicted several patterns of progression of the pandemic, uh, but overall 18 to 24 months at least where significant COVID-19 activity will be seen. Similarly, National Institute of Disaster Management, uh, a subwing of Ministry of Home Affairs, also released their uh, uh, report, and that they earlier said 67% would be required for us to, uh, a vaccination would be acquired for us to uh, achieve herd immunity, but that has increased to 80 to 90% of the population to be vaccinated uh, because of the new and mutant va variant seen. Amongst others, we have this IIT Kanpur team uh, that published a report in NIDM, which uh, has predicted at least three scenarios for yeah. the third wave peak. Nita, is Give it me possible one... to wrap you up? One minute? Yeah. Just, Just one, one more minute. minute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Despite important experts giving us predictions on the third wave that uh, is going to happen somewhere uh, in this quarter itself. Uh, there are also experts who are emphasizing that the states individually need to look at the uh, pattern data because there are geographical and uh, seasonal variations as well. So is Delta Plus a variant driver of the third wave? Possibly because it has increased transmissibility, stronger binding of uh, receptors in the lung cells and potential reduction of the monoclonal antibody response found across India, uh, not uh, found sparingly across India and a few countries as well. But uh, we are yet to understand if it does. Is the third wave going to be affecting children more than adults? Well, there is no evidence to say so, but only children, even if they are affected, may have mild and shorter illness and less hospitalization and may recover very quickly. Uh, so vaccination is the key, my friends, and uh, we need to increase the vaccination rate from 3.2% to um, much, much more. And if that is done, then we will have 25% less predicted cases. And the two main drivers are the slowdown in the rate of uh, decrease in COVID-19 infections and the increase in the R value. R value is nothing but how many number, how many people are infected by one COVID positive person on an average. So of course, encouraging vac vaccination and COVID appropriate behavior is the key. And thank you very much for this uh, you know, rapid fire masterclass for me, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Purvi. I know you had to really rush through your slides because there's shortage of time. I think before we close, let me give some conclusions. And first of all, thank you all of you, Dr. NK, Dr. Arvin and Purvi for giving the fantastic presentation on the COVID and diabetes. And before we close, the few points, important relevant points is there's no conclusive evidence that the risk of developing COVID-19 is greater in those with diabetes unless it's uncontrolled. But if someone with diabetes develops it, there is a lot of evidence that in-hospital mortality and disease severity can be worse. The lockdown did adversely affect the glycemic control. There are a lot of financial and social reasons for that. And of course, lack of physical activity added to that. The current epidemic has been associated with higher incidence of diabetic ketoacidosis and a new onset diabetes. There's a presentation even in the cell metabolism of the mechanism, how you can get new onset diabetes published on 3rd of August this year. And lots of opinion, observations, correlations and hypotheses that we have in the COVID time. There's a time to test these hypotheses, especially if the glucose control can improve the outcomes. With those concluding remarks, I hand over back to Nita. I'm sorry we short up in little time, but uh, I hope sometimes a big topic like this might require a little more time. Yeah. But anyway, thank you very much for this thank opportunity. You, thank you, Dr. Nita, thank and you. all other IDEC team. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you, thank thank you, you so very much, Dr. Nita. Nita, Dr. Sanjay, yeah. Dr. Anjali, Dr. Archana, all of you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank me, Purvi. Dr. Neglu, sir, you're the <laughs> mastermind. You. <laughs> Dr. Neglu is the mastermind. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all thank very, you much. very much. And we shall close this session. Thank okay. you.